Um, I'm Erin Cragen. I'm with the library. I'm the adult services department head and, sorry, I will get the distance for the mic right eventually. Um, I'm the adult services department head and um, current acting branch manager for this branch. Um, I am pleased to be joined by some of our other committee members from the Lafayette committee. Um, Craig Vassie is in the back and he's selling some really wonderful Lafayette uh, memorabilia. We have mugs and ornaments very reasonably priced and it all goes to this wonderful programs that we're putting on this year. So um, without further ado, I'm going to introduce Scott Harris, who is the executive, sorry, executive director of Mary Washington Museums. I had to write it down. <laughs> Welcome, Scott. Thank you very much, Aaron. Can you all hear me okay? Yes. Um, it's really wonderful that we can partner with the Central Rappahannock Regional Library, and so we're, we're grateful for the opportunity to be in this nice, big, spacious room with the wonderful arts, so we, we appreciate that very much. Um, since we are doing a little bit of um, shilling here, too, uh, I'd like to call on our public programs coordinator at the James Brown Museum, Lindsay Crawford, because this is a special day. Raise your hand if you went to Mary Wash or if you're going there currently. Okay, we got a few in the crowd. Okay, so some of you, I'm about to say, me too. Um, today is Mary Wash Giving Day. It's our annual fundraiser, um, and we are raising money today for the James Monroe Museum. It's our one day of year we can fundraise, so we really love any donations, $5, even a share on Facebook. I've been posting all day about it. Um, if you would like to donate, we will have the QR code to scan, or we also take cash donations. Um, over there, Jenna, can you wait for me? And our guide will be there, and I'll be over there also with pamphlets for, um, the James Monroe Museum, but also the Friends of Lafayette as well. So we hope you'll come over and say hi, and I hope you all enjoy the program. Thank you, Lindsay. Yeah, we, we actually fundraise more than one day, but it's just like a blitz that we did uh, on Giving Day. And, and because of that kind of uh, activity and the, the generosity of sponsors, we can do public programs uh, that the James Monroe Museum does, Gary Melcher's home in the studio, and we, we particularly thank the sponsors of the museum's public programs, um, the uh, Paul and Jane Jones Trust that our good friend Walter Sheffield administers, um, the James Monroe, James Monroe Memorial Foundation, and the Friends of the James Monroe Museum. So without that support, we could not do the public programs that we undertake. I am almost certain that Fredericksburg would have, under almost any circumstances, figured out a way to commemorate the bicentennial of Lafayette's visit to Fredericksburg without David and Lisa Durham. I think that it, it, is, it is a theoretical possibility, but one I do not want to contemplate because I don't think it would have had anything like the organization, the determination, and the heart and the soul that David and Lisa have brought to spearheading this effort to bringing such a wide circle of people together and inspiring them with the idea that we can commemorate this really landmark event in the city's history and in the nation's history. And so um, I think it's altogether fitting and proper, as Mr. Lincoln would say, to recognize David and Lisa Durham for their efforts in leading. <laughs> and we're just getting started. So go on down to the FAM and see the exhibit and uh, it's just gonna be wonderful. And for information, fxbg.com forward slash Lafayette uh, will get you the full schedule of what's going on for the year. Tim McGrath is a recipient of the Samuel Elliott Morrison Award for Naval Literature and a two-time winner of the Commodore John Barry Award for Maritime Literature. He's the author of John Barry, an American Hero in the Age of Sail, published in 2010. Give Me a Fast Ship, The Continental Navy and America's Revolution at Sea, published in 2015. And his latest book is James Monroe, A Life, published 2020. You've had a pretty nice, you know, every five years, you know, rotation. You've been doing. Looking. Not bad. And you may be on track here to, to do it again. Despite his terrible typing, <laughs> he is currently at work on four days at Gettysburg about the decisions that Abraham Lincoln Robert E. Lee and George Gordon Mead made before, during, and after the battle, and the consequences of those decisions. 
An avid sailor, Tim lives outside Philadelphia and one hopes that the authorities will one day let you back in. <laughs> but until then, we're grateful to have you with us. Tim McGrath. stand or clean up here. <laughs> I am so honored to be part of this and to be the first one means I'm either setting the bar or lowering it. <laughs> we will find out. But I'd like to thank Jared and Scott and Lindsay and the staff at the James Monroe Museum and uh, also to Dan Preston, Heidi Stello, Bob Karak, Karacek, who is not here, and the team that puts the Monroe papers together. And also uh, a send out and thank you to Aaron and the Central Rappahannock Regional Library and to the organization of the Lafayette commemoration. Well done, well done. I'm working without a net tonight because this is the first time I'm actually gonna pull the book out and read part of it. Uh, I don't know what that thumping is, but oh, it's fine. There you go. Is that any better? Don't be so close to me. Okay. Oh, good. That's even better. All right. Talking about Monroe and Lafayette before this group of experts <laughs> is for someone my age, like doing a pitching clinic before Kofax, Gibson, and Marischal. <laughs> and you guys did not see me pitch in school or semi-pro. My first history lesson came from Walt Disney at the end of 1954. My mother woke me up to watch Davy Crockett Indian Fighter, and I was hooked. A couple months later, it was Davy Crockett in Congress, and that was not quite as good when you're four, but it was okay. <laughs> and then it was followed by Davy Crockett at the Alamo. <laughs> Imagine my surprise in March of 55 when I woke up on my birthday to find in the small living room above my grandparents' house a Davy Crockett at the Alamo set. My father put the walls together, the Alamo together, this was even better than owning the 45, uh, having a coonskin cap and a t-shirt. And I fell immediately in love with my favorite toy. Sometime in May, I was playing outside of the front porch and Eddie, the seven-year-old boy across the street, came over and said, what are you doing? I said, I'm playing Davy Crockett at the Alamo. He says, can I play? I said, sure, you can be the Mexicans. <laughs> So he proceeded to very effectively play the Mexicans and did something I'd never seen before. He took his finger and just started knocking off all the Texans on the scaffold. <laughs> and eventually found the Davy Crockett model, who I had perched on the top of the Alamo with three Mexican soldiers. And after knocking two of them off for good measure, he knocked off Davy Crockett, who fell eight inches to his death. <laughs> I said, what are you doing? And he said, killing Davy Crockett, not knowing that that could be the future title of Bill O'Reilly book. <laughs> <laughs> and my immediate response was, Davy Crockett didn't die at the Alamo. And he said, of course he did. And I said, I, I, he did not. I said, the, 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 those of you who remember seeing it, the last Little scene, the song comes back on, and Tress Parker, I mean Davy, <laughs> is swinging his rifle butt at the Mexicans, fade to black, the song comes up, and it's over. Yeah, so I again repeat it, he did not die at the Alamo. <laughs> and he told me I was stupid and went home. <laughs> <laughs> I could not wait for my dad to get home that night. And when he did, I didn't even waste any time. I just said, did Davy Crockett die at the Alamo? Yes, he said. When did this happen? <laughs> I thought I was watching newsreel footage that this was not exactly, and it all made sense to a four-year-old. Of course they don't have cars yet in Tennessee. They don't have them in Texas, except for Roy Rogers' sidekick. You don't catch the Lone Ranger and Tonto driving a truck or something like that. 
He told me it happened 120 years ago. He looked at me like I wasn't quite all put together. <laughs> and that was my first history lesson. I promise tonight that this is a much more factual presentation. <laughs> In August of 1777, two young officers met at the Continental Army encampment outside of Philadelphia. One was a teenage lieutenant from Virginia who had almost died at the Battle of Trenton when he crossed the Delaware ahead of Washington and his, the bulk of his army to be part of the advance brigade. The other was a Frenchman, just a little bit age difference, who Congress had made a major general, but came from a very established French family with years and generations of army service and he came over at his own expense buying a ship to get him here because he wanted to take part in the great experiment of the American Revolution. The two of them, the following month, fought at the Battle of Brandywine. They actually had an interesting instance. It was not just Lafayette's first battle, but it was Monroe's first time as serving as an aide to Lord Sterling and learning how to get quick on horseback back and forth to either General Washington or Sterling's officers with any change in orders. They finally were both together at a place, a knoll called Birmingham Hill, which is where there was a Quaker meeting house uh, that had certainly seen less active days than the end of the Battle of Brandywine. And Lafayette, in fact, was wounded on Birmingham Hill and he refused to leave the field of battle until he could get his troops in order for a very organized retreat. After a few weeks of fighting, intermittently, but then including the Battle of Gettysburg, and after the loss of Fort Mifflin and Fort Mercer on the Delaware, protecting Philadelphia, Washington abandoned Philadelphia for Valley Forge. At this point, both of these gentlemen were very much spared what, what so many of the soldiers had gone through and the women that followed the fort. The, the camps became a breeding ground for typhus and pneumonia, but Monroe had his own headquarters and not too far from that, Lord Sterling also set up quarters, sharing a house with the Curry family. He and his aides got the first floor and the Curry family stayed on the second. When we did research on this book, I was allowed to go into the Sterling headquarters, which has been closed for years, mainly because of termite damage. So when you went upstairs, they had about this wide planks so that you could walk across to the other room. A friend of mine from high school came with me and he, aren't you gonna cross? No. <laughs> <laughs> but it was a rather remarkable house and it had, I'd never seen this before, but they had a chimney that did the work for two rooms. It was built like a V so that it could heat two bedrooms up. After Valley Forge, when General Clinton, now in charge of the army, headed up to New Jersey, and Washington felt this was a time to test Baron von Steuben's training. They dogged the British up to New Jersey and finally attacked the rear guard on June 28th under a sweltering hot day. Uh, it was an interesting day for Lafayette. Uh, Washington wanted to give the command for this off offense to General Charles Lee, who had just been, for, you know, exchanged and captured. And Lee looked at the whole idea and thought, this is never gonna work and refused to do it. Washington bypassed Lord Sterling and then gave the command to Monroe when- Bobby. Lafayette. Or Monroe, Lafayette, these guys were just the first time. <laughs> uh, when he uh, realized that Washington was serious, Lee went back and said, you shouldn't give it to him, he's not experienced enough, I'll take it. And while Lafayette was not happy about it, he acquiesced and went back to his own troops. However, that morning when he saw how Lee's contradictory orders and complete falling apart, was creating a route. It was Lafayette who rode to Washington and said, you better get up here and lead this fight. And the end result was technically a draw, 
but it was the Redcoats who left the field and Washington felt that was a victory. In no small part to Lafayette, nor Monroe, who took a very hazardous scouting trip and got within a football field of Cornwallis's division as they were planning an attack on the right flank and was able to write with a pencil, as he reported, and send his soldiers back up the hill to let Sterling and Washington know what was happening. But after Monmouth, both men sort of went their separate ways. Lafayette went back for the first of a couple of trips to Paris, mainly to raise money and also see if he could talk the king and his court into bringing more troops over. The Stang had already come with his fleet. And he succeeded in getting a 6,000 man army under Rochambeau to come back to the United States. Meanwhile, our other hero came back here to Virginia where he got a lieutenant colonelcy in the state militia and also began studying law under this fellow named Thomas Jefferson. Things went very well in that regards for both of them. They did re-meet at Yorktown when Lafayette was commanding his own force and Monroe, who uh, was desperate to get in the action, agreed to serve as a volunteer. Part of the 15,000 combined army of Americans and French who kept the uh, uh, British ensconced in Yorktown by land while the French fleet kept pounding them by sea. Afterwards, <clears throat> for the next 10 years, Monroe rose in political importance. Lafayette went with Franklin, Adams, and the Jays, keeping them company at, his, at the Hotel de Lafayette in Paris, where he had them over on weekly visits and meals. Over the next decade, Monroe became an avatar of Jeffersonian politics. In fact, at one point, he was more Jeffersonian than Jefferson was. <laughs> had he been alive today in his early years, he was such a partisan that he would have certainly been on nightly news at MSNBC or Fox, depending on what the issue was. <clears throat> Meanwhile, in France, Lafayette was in truly in a no-win situation. He took on various political and military positions, all of which he was hell-bent and determined to try to find some middle ground and maybe win enough support from the revolutionaries and at the same time not get the uh, aristocracy in too much trouble. However, he was eventually called an enemy of the people by both Danton and Robespierre, and by 1794, Lafayette had been captured by the Austrians after he fled France and was now confined that year in Olmutz prison, while his wife, Adrienne, was in Plessy prison in Paris, a converted hotel, because the prisons were all filled with people waiting to be beheaded. Governor Morris, there's Robespierre getting seized. Governor Morris at the time was Washington's minister to France, and it was the last place he wanted to be and the last place he should have been. He basically spent most of his time enjoying French food and the wine and the ladies, but really not a fan of what he saw around him and was quite frightened for his own life. He did, however, try to support two people in getting them out of prison. One was Adrienne Lafayette, the other was Thomas Paine. Washington had plans at home with John Jay to send him to England and work out a treaty with them. And astutely knew that if he was going to have things work that way, he would need a better person to explain his policies once they became news in France but he hid them from the person who was his third choice to be the minister to France after Madison and Robert Livingston. The Monroes, I'm sorry, Monroe, two, two. <laughs> Last time I have swordfish with Harris again. <laughs> I thought Fred fish was memory food. <laughs> However, the Monroes arrive, James, Elizabeth, and Eliza. James becomes a hit with a wonderful speech he made before the assembly, and Elizabeth was the Jacqueline Kennedy of the trip. Everybody my age remembers 
President Kennedy's remark when he came back from Europe in 61. I'd like to introduce myself. I'm the man who escorted Jacqueline Kennedy to Paris. Monroe could have said the same thing about Elizabeth, who the French immediately called La Belle Americaine. But this leads to one of Elizabeth's finest hours. <clears throat> Realizing that there we go, Adrienne is in prison and Tom Paine is in prison, Monroe has a, a bit of a conundrum. How far can he push the French government in getting both of them released? He does some work with Paine, which actually turns out to be easier. But the week before the Monroes arrive, Adrian's mother, sister, and grandmother had been beheaded. A week later, Rose Pierre was beheaded. But Monroe is trying to figure out how to do this and how to get something to work. And it is Elizabeth who comes up with the solution. One morning, she has her carriage cleaned and ready to go. She gets in her finest dress, not the one being held hostage at the Museum of the American Revolution, <laughs> before Scott reminds me. <laughs> and a wonderful basket of, of wine, fruits, and bread, and shows up at Pleasant Prison. She has, Monroe can't come. She has herself driven through the streets of Paris. If any of you have seen the 1935 version of A Tale of Two Cities, and how it showed the squalor in the alleys and the streetways and how coming from the home where there was a minister and further and further into town where things get worse and more dangerous. That was what Elizabeth was going into. And once she gets out and explains at the gate who she is, the turnkey came upstairs to where Adrian was kept. She believed that he was coming to get her for the guillotine. Imagine her surprise when she found Elizabeth Monroe. It was the first step in weeks of what went on until the Monroes were finally able to get her released, to get her smuggled out of France, and get their son, George Washington Lafayette, here to Virginia and to George Washington. Monroe returns to the States in John Adams' quote as the disgraced minister but is elected to governor. There's, there's Elizabeth, held, hence called the Bella American for a good reason. And there's the reunion in prison with the Marquis and his wife and daughters in Olmos prison. <coughs> but in 18, and he gets elected governor, but in uh, 1803, Thomas Jefferson reaches out and says to Monroe, you're going back to France. He is trying to negotiate the purchase of New Orleans, and it's not going very well for Mr. Livingston, who's over there. And he convinces Monroe by saying, no other man can be found. So again, the Monroes return to France. One of the individuals that uh, he tells him to look out for is Livingston. He doesn't quite trust what Livingston is telling him one thing and doing another and working with Talleyrand, who, those of you don't know, is a, a French minister, uh, was the best friend of anybody he was in the room with until he or she left. <laughs> but uh, this, by the way, is, it, uh, is this is my favorite portrait of Jefferson. It's done by Jamie Wyatt, and it's not nearly as popular as it should be, but I think he captures him terrifically, the fact that the hair is a bit askew, but the, the face and the pensive look. This is the Jefferson I like to remember. John C. Calhoun. No, he doesn't look like John C. Calhoun. <laughs> <laughs> that was that loud? I'm sorry. <laughs> this may be the only time in my life I get to correct you. <laughs> I agree to disagree. <laughs> But one of the most influential people in helping Monroe with this work is obviously Napoleon, who also had a hand in getting Adrian Lafayette out of Paris. They meet 
on a couple of occasions, but one is this giant dinner where all of the dignitaries in Paris are gathered for this meal. And they're all looking at, especially the British minister, at Napoleon walking over to talk to James Monroe. And he starts the conversation with, tell me about Jefferson. Uh, is he married? No. Does he have children? He has two daughters. They're married. Oh, uh, the house he lives in, is it a grand house? Yes, it is. Um, and he's still, basically, he's trying to say, is he still with it? And it's uh, around 60 years old. And then as the English minister approaches, Napoleon whispers to Monroe, you Americans did a wonderful job beating the British. You will do it again. <laughs> Almost as if he knew exactly what was going to be happening. And as we all know, Monroe pulled a pretty good real estate deal. He went from getting uh, New Orleans to uh, doubling the size of the United States. And uh, not a bad deal for a fellow who's going to be president. At one uh, presentation on Monroe, somebody uh, asked me, how would you compare him to President Trump? <laughs> and I said, I'd rather not. <laughs> but at one point, did make the point that, you know, well, you know, Mr. Trump has been elected because of his great business savvy and his, you know, great successes as a real realtor. I said, Monroe owns too, but he really only had two big real estate deals. One's called the Louisiana Purchase and the other's called Florida. <laughs> Years before Mar-a-Lago. <laughs> While they were back, they did have a wonderful union with the Lafayettes at their at Lafayette Traditional Palace, the Grange. I wondered, have you, have you guys been there? Has anybody been to the Grange? Because it, it looks rather imposing. But time passes, and Monroe serves as Secretary of State and Secretary of War during the War of 1812 and the burning of Bladensburg, as we see here. And then after Madison's time is done, he's elected president. And he and his wife take over what has been a much more vocal White House with the Madisons but the Monroes are reverting it back to the days of Washington. In fact, Monroe, I think everybody, a lot of you folks know that Washington and Monroe became estranged actually over Paris. But when Monroe ascends to the presidency, it's almost as with he's, with he's challenging Washington. Even during his great tours, you know, he's wearing basically an old Continental Army uniform, the Chapeau hat, the, the tan waistcoat and breeches and the dark blue jacket. And it really is the first time that the country gets to see a president of the United States. Uh, Nicholas Biddle had written to him about going on his tour saying, this is gonna be terrific because most of America thinks that the president is the clerk of Congress. Mm -hmm. And he certainly went a long way to, to changing that image. <clears throat> Monroe had come so close in 18, after the era of good feelings, but even in the difficulties of a second term, which includes the Missouri Compromise, uh, on the surface to ending partisanship, he really didn't end it, but he gave that impression. And now we think of his whole eight years as an era of good feelings. But it pretty much ended once he was reelected and all of a sudden, he had, there were five candidates for the presidency, three of them in his own cabinet. But Monroe had his one great last swan song, and that was the Monroe Doctrine. And I can't think of any letter or thing written to Monroe that made him happier in his life than Jefferson writing to him and said, this sets our compass. And it has, for good or bad, ever since, depending on what president was using it. But he also got a letter from France. I am delighted with your liberal mind in Europe and South America. And that was from the Marquis de Lafayette. In 1824, 
he wrote Monroe again. And I'm going to jump ship here because, and I got into this and reading and looking at all this, I've never been one to share what I read in a, I know other authors do it, but I like this part so much and I thought, I hope I got it right, so you be the judge. In the winter of 1824, Monroe had received a letter from Paris. I often dream of the day when I will be able, without remorse, to enjoy the happiness of finding myself once again on American ground. Recent years had not been too kind to the Marquis. He had lost political elections at the ballot box and was considered an enemy by Louis XVIII and his sycophants. The king took to calling Lafayette that animal. A lifelong champion of liberal policies in France, he was heartsick when Louis, Louis's ultra-conservative government allied itself with the Holy Alliance. The France he had dreamed of and worked for would not come to pass. But instead of licking his wounds, Lafayette again looked to America. He saw a journey there as a way to keep his cause for liberty in the old world alive. European newspapers would certainly publish accounts from America about his travels, even if Louis censured those accounts in France and Monroe would surely welcome him. The president responded immediately with the warmest of letters assuring Lafayette he would be the nation's guest. Monroe shared Lafayette's dismay at the return of the Bour 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 Bourbons in France and Spain. Was the bloodshed during the reign of terror and the Napoleonic Wars merely for the restoration of the divine right of French kings? Lafayette did not think so, and neither did Monroe. Our revolution gave birth to that of France, Monroe once wrote Madison. Perhaps Lafayette's visit could keep the flame alive in that country. Monroe was also sure Lafayette's imminent arrival would create a nostalgic wave of unity that both he and the United States could benefit from. After some debate among his cabinet, Monroe decided Lafayette's invitation should come from Congress. With relations touchy at best with France, it was decided to make Lafayette's visit unofficial. When a frigate was designated to bring the Marquis to America, Lafayette politely refused, well aware that any such display would have consequences with the Holy Alliance that Monroe did not need. Instead, the merchantman Cadmus carried him to New York. There, countless ships, festooned with pennants, crowded the gunnels and carried the small bands escorted the Cadmus into the harbor until she nestled against the battery docks, where thousands of welcoming New Yorkers cheered his arrival. The procession to City Hall took two hours. Joyous parents held their children over the crowds so that they could tell their children and grandchildren they saw the personification of French assistance to America when it was most needed. Lafayette was emotionally overwhelmed. One year younger than Monroe at 65, actually he's older. His six foot frame carried considerably more pounds, one showing the sign of elephantitis. But parades of all sizes honored the man the New York American called our most distinguished visitor. At each stop, Lafayette, like the tear-stained faces of the aging veterans in the crowds, grew younger before them. Standing taller, his face radiant, just as his old friend Monroe had done on his tours of the United States several years before. Also in the crowds were men of color who had fought alongside Lafayette, including James Armistead, an enslaved Virginian who had done essential service to the Marquis during the Revolution, compelling him to plea for Armistead's freedom. Lafayette's old comrade remained in Washington arranging for the Marquis to spend weeks touring the states before coming to Washington was both a shrewd diplomatic ploy as well as a theatrical one. Had Lafayette come to Washington first, Monroe confided to Jefferson, it would have compromised his administration with the Holy Alliance. Now Lafayette's trip was officially a personal visit to the country that loved him more than France ever did. And this is a picture of Philadelphia during Lafayette's tour. 
Lafayette's tour took months and it's the longest retirement tour in American history <laughs> until shares in 2000. <laughs> <laughs> Don't tell Cher. <laughs> Surprisingly, Elizabeth's health improved enough that she could make a prolonged visit to New York for most of the summer and got to see Monroe at that point. But a happy diversion occurred in August after he was pre after uh, Monroe was no longer president in August of 1825. When President Adams, Lafayette with his son, Penge Ringgold, and several servants came for a visit. They almost did not get there. Six miles from Oak Hill, Monroe's home in Northern Virginia, the cross tree of Adams' carriage cracked, rendering it unworkable. Young Lafayette and Ringgold handed over their small gig to Adams and the Marquis and walked alongside the servant's wagon. For four days, Monroe and his guests happily endured an oppressive heat wave, staying indoors until dusk. A host of visitors came to pay their respects. On a visit to a friend of Monroe's, they learned a double christening was taking place. Monroe happily sponsored one child while the new president, reluctant but feigning pleasure, stood for the other. <laughs> Can you imagine having Two children being christened by James Monroe and John Quincy Adams. <laughs> and then think about, well, my guy was nicer than yours. <laughs> the following morning, Monroe headed home while the Adams Lafayette entourage returned to Washington on roads most unfit to be traveled. One of Adam's horses stumbled, fell, and died. They did not reach Georgetown until dark. In his inaugural, Adams assured his audience he would carry on Monroe's determination for road improvements. <laughs> he did not need to be reminded of that promise after this trip. Two weeks later, Lafayette returned to Oak Hill to take Monroe with him to Charlottesville, where the Frenchman was to be honored by the faculty and students of the University of Virginia. Their visit to Monticello was heart-wrenching. The estate had seen better days. One visit to visitors we preserve, preserve for the rest of the generations. Thank you very much. Does anybody have any questions? Going once. <laughs> Going twice. Well, thank you. So oh, yes. How well did Monroe speak French? Is there any evidence? Very well. Okay. He Where had, did he have learned it? He was not from a family that would have learned it growing up. No, but the, the neat thing about Monroe, I think of, um, and I don't think any of our presidents, some are as good as he was with this, or as good as he is with it, but not all of them is. When he tackled something, he mastered it. He had some French in school, I believe, you know, rudimentary with that. But Jefferson at one point left him a French cook who certainly got him along with that. And while he was at Valley Forge, he had two friends from France. One was Lafayette. The other was a young aide of Baron von Steuben's, Pierre de Ponceau. And he was a frail little guy with uh, glasses. I, I had visited him in my mind, and I'm showing my age, but some of you guys might remember. Wally Cox is a Frenchman. <laughs> <laughs> and apparently just as funny, but, but Monroe picked up his French from that and he spoke it unerringly well. I mean, he was willing to go to the French assembly at a time when Governor Morris had made sure that we weren't welcome. The only thing that Governor Morris didn't come up with was Liberty Tries. Uh, <laughs> but he, uh, uh, he was cheered resoundingly for his his, uh, his speech and a couple of other times where he made remarks. His French was very good. And I'm sure he also had some help with that with Elizabeth because she was also uh, very fluent in French. That's a, nobody asked me that question before. That's a good question. I had five years of French and all I can say is to a droll the sea style on edge, which for those of you who never had French is how subtle you look in the snow. <laughs> yes, sir. Given the regional variations that both
of fame to joy here in the States. How would these two men have pronounced their names in their time? I think with uh, American and French accents. <laughs> <laughs> That's all you're going to get from me. I'm not going to <laughs> if I was Henry Higgins, I could get into it a lot better. But uh, yes, ma'am. You spoke about um, Washington Adams not loving uh, Monroe's time in France. Can you speak a little bit more about that? What was what sure. Were they? Sure. Let me just grab real quick. <clears throat> Washington sent Monroe to France and was Secretary of State Randolph and uh, was told, you know, you're to win France over, but don't succeed too well. At the same time, he did not say a word to Monroe, but he was sending John Jay over to London to come up with what became the Jay Treaty, which Washington knew was sure to tick off the French because there was a lot of concessions that the Americans made in this that were something that the French would be greatly annoyed by. And once Monroe found out about this, he was ticked and he was, to be honest with you, he, he, he decided to pay Washington back in kind. So he would write letters to the, you know, Madison or to Jefferson and, anybody, and, and, and unfortunately, one letter he wrote to somebody in Philadelphia got intercepted by Washington's, uh, member of Washington's cabinet, I think it was uh, McHenry, or might have been Pickering. But in any event, that, at that point, they knew, well, we have Monroe where, where we want him. And of course, Adams succeeds Monroe, and he's a Federalist, so he's never been a real fan of, of James Monroe. Then when Monroe comes back, he writes a 400 page diatribe called A View of the Executive. It's a lot longer. In fact, the titles, the book comes to here and the title goes to here. <laughs> but it's basically a rant about how he was treated by Washington. And Washington's copy is, I think, at Yale University. And it has side notes. You know, Washington doesn't complain, Washington doesn't do this. Um, should I get the book and read some of Washington's comments? Do you guys want to hear what Washington said about yeah. Andrew? Hang on. <laughs> Would it be under a view of the executive, hopefully? No. If they come to the James and Art Museum and buy your book, they can read it themselves. <laughs> yeah, I was just told if you come to the museum and buy the book, it's it, all I can tell you. <laughs> well, here's one part. I'll tell you what. It's a, it's, there's a lot of, he, he will, Monroe will state this, and, and Washington's comments are, yeah, right. Most of Washington's comments, if they were written today in the side of this thing, would begin with WTF. <laughs> but talking about the founding fathers and their, and their circle, uh, John Jay was accompanied by Mr. Trumbull, the famous painter of the paintings that hang in the Capitol. And uh, Monroe wants, he goes, I want to see the treaty. And Jay's not sending it over there because he'll hand it over to the French and he'll undo everything. But he tells Trumbull, memorize it, and then you can recite it to Monroe. So he comes up and says, it's top secret. It's not this, you can't say anything like that, but I'll recite it to you. And Monroe's like, I don't want, no, I don't want to have the knowledge of this from you and then not, then have the French say, well, do you know what it is? He wasn't going to take it from Trumbull, but he did have another American that was a friend of his to go to Trumbull and say, Monroe said, tell me what it says. <laughs> so he recited it to him, and then he went back to Monroe, and Monroe was going, oh. <laughs> <laughs> The sad thing about the relationship with Washington was that when Monroe's elected governor, it's in December of 1799, and he's now thinking, I wonder if I reach out to Washington. He, he was very kind to me, was very supportive. There was one trip when he and a very pregnant Elizabeth are coming back from Congress and they stop at Mount Vernon. Martha isn't there, but George makes sure that 
Elizabeth has a bath and the best bedroom in the house and has every creature company taken. And being a husband, I'm sure when Martha came back, boy, you should have seen how well I treated Mrs. Martha. You'd have been very proud of me, Martha. <laughs> but, uh, uh, but ironically, I'm, I'm spoiling parts of the book, uh, but ironically, the day before Washington gets ill and dies and he's out in this foul weather carrying the grounds, and he comes back in his uh, amenuous, amenuensis. He says, read me the newspapers. And he starts reading, oh, Monroe's been elected governor. <laughs> 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 and he gets so apoplectic to it that uh, last moment says, well, go lay down. And he lays down and never gets up. Mm -hmm. With John Adams, it gets a little better because he's, Adams wants to come to Virginia while Monroe is governor. And the rite of passage, you know, the rituals are the governor will welcome the president of the United States. Monroe writes him a letter saying, considering that we both hate each other's guts, I'm not gonna welcome you. <laughs> and Adams does not come. However, when Monroe is made Secretary of State by Madison, back up in Quincy, up in Braintree at Peacefield, John Adams goes, okay, Jefferson, Secretary of State, President. Madison, Secretary of State, President. Monroe, Secretary of State. Dear Secretary Monroe, congratulations <laughs> on your pick. You're gonna do terrific things. By the way, you know, I have a son that's been a diplomat since he was four over in Europe, and you'd make a great secretary. And they have a very nice reunion on Monroe's tour of New England, so they, they get to make it up. Any other questions? Yes? Does your book talk about Eliza? Like, she was kind of raised to be a princess, and like, didn't she go to school with Napoleon's stepdaughter? Yes. And she had that, like, attitude yes. when she came over, and yes. Americans didn't really like that. That attitude. Now, nobody like that. John Quincy Adams says, you can't tell her anything close to a secret because it's going to be in Virginia and Pennsylvania within, you know, hours. That she Explain who you're talking about. Eliza, you're talking about the daughter. Yeah. Thank you. Because Elizabeth was much, as the mother was much better. Eliza has a good point, though. So, uh, we were just, do you want to take this? <laughs> no, I'm not being facetious, I, because we were just talking about there's a movement of bringing Eliza's remains back from Paris. She's buried in the same cemetery as Moliere and Jim Morrison at the doors. Wouldn't that be an interesting conversation? <laughs> Light your own fire. <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, but at one point, she's takes care of one of Calhoun's children, who's deathly ill. And Calhoun's got, there's not a better nurse in town than Eliza Monroe, but she's, she's a jerk. <laughs> and she learned to be a snob by, from Citizen Janae's sister. And the thing I found so ironic about it is that her best friend, young Mademoiselle Ornay, her son, is Napoleon III. So the first crisis in this hemisphere of the Monroe Doctrine comes from Eliza's best friend's son. I mean, this is the sort of stuff you can't. But she was not very popular with it. it it's kind of sad. And then after both parents died, she doesn't even stay in the country. She loved France and went back to France. In fact, I think she went in a convent. I was raised by nuns. I can't imagine what Mother Eliza would have been like. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Yes, sir. Yeah, where did you do your research? Where did you go to do your research? About three minutes from here. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the, the first stop I met was at, the, was at the, the first stop I made was at the James Monroe Museum, and I've been a pest there for nine years. But oh my God, the basement has artifacts and everything and there's letters there was a piece I couldn't put in the book where Monroe very late in his life he's comparing the nationalities of people he's met by and it, it, it 
it doesn't sound like Jimmy the Greek, and it, but that, I think he's believing it's enlightened. But it's it, you know at some point you go, oh, that's an interesting of No, thank you. Yeah. Uh, and yet, okay, he's he's you know seventy years old, and you know maybe he's getting to turn into at times the Clint Eastwood movie character anymore. Get off my yard. But uh, but then at the same time, when he's trying to write a book about the people, the sovereigns, and it's not dynamite prose, but the point he's trying to make is, is really cogent. So, uh, but they're uh, very nicely treated at Highland, and uh, and there's Monroe stuff all over the place. In fact, right before the book went to the galleys. I'm trying to remember, it was at Lisa Francovia down at Mon uh, Monticello. But the story had always been that Monroe never freed any of his enslaved persons. And I'm a half hour away from the Historical Society of Pennsylvania where there's quite a bit of Monroe documentation. And all of a sudden, Sarah Von Harper sent me this thing that they have found through his son-in-law that on his deathbed, he freed a man named Peter Marx who was married to one of the Hemings family. And it was misfiled in the Historical Society of Pennsylvania. I'm going, how am I going to explain this to Scott that I couldn't find this? <laughs> and, the, and, the, and the curator, Lee Arnold, just said, it's not your fault. We fouled it up, but at least we found it in time for the book to come out. Um, but uh, uh, it, there's a lot, you know, the New York Historical Society, New York Public Library has a good bit. And then one of the other things, if you really want to read something that we haven't really mentioned really a couple of times, but if you really want to understand what the uh, first 30 years of the country was like, go online and read John Quincy Adams' diaries. They are unbelievable. And he gets snippy and catty, but you could not write a book about the Monroe presidency if those books, accurately if those didn't exist. And at one point he, he writes during the uh, Monroe's Monroe's Lyndon Johnson during the Missouri Compromise. He's involved, but he's not even telling his cabinet that he's involved. And it's not a big town back then. There's like four buildings. And somehow he's able to hide it from his cabinet until he's ready to tell them what he's doing. And quite often, Quincy Adams is Secretary of State from Massachusetts, and John Calhoun, the Secretary of War from South Carolina, would walk together. And after one of these debates in, in Adams' diary, he writes, Calhoun says to me, he got into a big argument saying, Declaration of Independence says all men are created equal. This is op opportunity to say more about that and do something. And Calhoun <coughs> makes the comment, you know, you Yankees view that as everybody's created equal. We don't feel that way in the South. And the way Adams is like, he knows this, and it's another thing that he believes it, but then it, it's another thing for Calhoun to say it. And the way he writes it is a bit of, I knew it, and at the same time, I don't believe this. But the, the research, you know, and there's so many terrific things to learn about this man. He's, he, I, I, I had no idea what I was getting into, and the book came out four years after it was supposed to, in <laughs> the five-year reign of things. But uh, goodness, it, it was a lot of fun. Yes, sir. So, you, you treated this a little bit, but could you could you talk about the Grand Tour, Lafayette's Grand Tour, in the context of uh, Monroe's rationale or, or need for him to come, both domestically and also uh, geopolitically? Sure. Like we alluded to in a bit of it, you know, it was a combination of this is a, a dear friend, this is a man that I really loved, and while. I haven't, you know, they would go a decade without seeing each other. But I do think at the same time, he was looking for a good way to go out. He really didn't, you know, can you imagine if he came up with the Monroe Doctrine with John Quincy Adams in this day and age with 24 seven news and how it would be, my God, look what he did, look what this is. But back then it was, it's a letter and he handed it to the Congress to read. So it really didn't get much publicity. But he really knew that Lafayette was beloved, and I think he saw it as an opportunity. But then here again is, is the George H.W. Bush part of James Monroe. It's his show. 
I'm not coming with him. I'm not going to say, look what I said, Lord, Lyndon John, look what I've done for all of you. You know, he lets him have the limelight and everything else. And, and that did a world of good. And it was covered in the, in the press. I didn't look, to be honest with anybody, I, I didn't look at any or try to find any of the <coughs> French newspapers if they reported that for one reason, because I wasn't sure that they did, and the other reason is two-way draw was siege time on edge. <laughs> <laughs> so, although when you read the French, if you've had five years, sometimes it comes back. John Paul Jones, when we're doing research, he's writing in French, and it's so rudimentary. It's almost like the Jet Clampett School of French. <laughs> I know what he's saying, but uh, la plume de matant. Um, but he really did look at it as an opportunity for both and he was a politician. This is going to be a good way for me to go out on. You know, that I, this is the closest I can go back to the era of good feelings tours, and that's that's the nuts and bolts of it. Any other questions? Yes. Um, can you just say that a little louder, please? When did Lafayette meet Napoleon? When did Lafayette meet Napoleon. Napoleon? Meet Napoleon. Oh, probably easily, if not in the late 1780s, 1790s. Napoleon was a military hero by 1793, and then uh, uh, it would uh, probably when you when you read a biography of him, there's nobody that ever played both sides against the middle than Napoleon did. He, it's just remarkable. But I did love this story about him talking to uh, Monroe at this big dinner because everybody's, what's he saying and what's he doing? In fact, the, the neat thing about Napoleon, if, if, with the, uh, some of you folks probably know this, about the uh, Louisiana Purchase, his two brothers come into Napoleon's bathroom where he's taking a bath, or a chamber, chamber, and uh, this is wrong, you shouldn't be doing this, and, so, and, and he just basically stands up stark naked and goes, what do you two guys know about this? This is gonna be a great deal for us, and, and leaves it to that. That's a good question, nobody ever asked me that before. <laughs> going once, going twice. Thank you guys so very much. <laughs>